Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. Final day of Jazz Fest here at the Allison Minor Music Heritage Stage. We just want to thank a few people really quick before we get started with our next interview. We do want to thank Shell. They are the festival's presenting sponsor this year. We also want to thank Acura, People's Health, Miller Lite, Coca-Cola, the Fairgrounds Race Course and Slots, the Sheraton New Orleans Hotel, TuneIn, Zatarans, and the many others with their presence around the grounds. The festival relies on the support of these sponsors to bring you the very best talent year after year, so if you're enjoying what you're hearing around the fest, you can definitely thank our sponsors. We also want to mention the Jazz Fest app. The Jazz Fest app is available for free in both iPhone and Android formats, features up to the minute schedule changes, an interactive map of the grounds, and much more to enhance your Jazz Fest experience. We also want to let you know that this year is, a, is an important year for us here at the Fest, Axis TV is going to be broadcasting uh, the festival. Uh, they broadcasted the third and fourth, and they'll also broadcast today. So if you can't be here, if you have family members around the country that can't be here, you can be sure to let them know they can catch the Fest live on Axis TV. <laughs> and without any further ado, today we would like to go ahead and welcome to the stage our next interviewer, Mr. Bruce Rayburn. He'll be speaking with Nicholas Payton. Please welcome them to the stage. And we'd like to remind you, please, no video recording on this set. Thank you all very much. Hey, everyone, and welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, this is truly a treat to have an opportunity to talk with It's on, but not close enough. Okay. So let me repeat. I'm very pleased to be here. Very pleased to have you with us. And uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, have Nicholas Payton join us today. Uh, before we get rolling, I want to do what I always do in these occasions, which is to give a shout out to Allison Miner. Uh, Allison worked at the Hogan Jazz Archive when she first came to New Orleans in the late 1960s. And uh, the curator at the time, Dick Allen, uh, was the one who uh, responded to George Ween when he was looking for some talent to help him build a festival here. And you know Quint got involved, and uh, you know it's a very successful festival, but when it comes to the soul of this festival, we have to talk about Allison Minor. So uh, she's the one, I think, that we uh, will always be thinking of uh, at the Music Heritage stage. She built it. Uh, some mutual friends of ours uh, worked here early on, like Monifa Johnson was an intern with Allison. So uh, we want to remember Allison uh, with every word uh, we speak today because she is still a presence at Jazz Fest. So I had, had to say that. I was happy to say it. But uh, now I want to get moving uh, with Nicholas Payton, and I'm sure you all know who he is, but we're going to pretend like you don't and get some basics out of the way because this is uh, an oral history interview that is going to be made available at the Jazz and Heritage Festival archives. And so, Nick, if you would begin by letting us know where you were born, we know the answer, and when you were born, and then we'll proceed from there. How y'all doing? <laughs> I'm Nicholas Payton. I was born and raised right here in New Orleans, Louisiana, September 26th. 1973. So you're about to hit 40 in a couple months. Yep. Anybody that goes to the uh, standard reference works on jazz history are going to realize when they see the section on Nicholas Payton that he has made very good use of his time. Uh, it's truly amazing, in fact, how much uh, you've accomplished and how much space uh, they devote to you. Uh, and it's well deserved. Uh, but I want to go back to the beginning and talk about what it's like coming up in a musical family in New Orleans because I'm sure everyone knows uh, Walter Payton Jr. was your father. He was a bass player who was in very high demand. He worked with everybody. And your mom was a classical pianist as well, was she not? As so well you as came from a musical family. Yeah. So what was it like growing up in that environment? Uh, well, my mom was also a former operatic singer. Um, Man, I just, it's great music. I grew up with it, uh, not only from my parents, but uh, our place, uh, we used to live on uh, Louisiana Parkway where I was born. Uh, was sort of the place where a lot of the musicians would congregate. Whatever bands my father was working in, 
uh, we always rehearsed at my house. Uh, we had a grand piano and a lot of space. Uh, so uh, I got to meet so many great musicians from early on. Um, Clyde Kerr Jr., who uh, would teach me later at NOCA, but I knew him well before I started going to school. Uh, Teddy Riley, um, Ellis Marcellus, Eddie Collins, uh, Herbert Taylor, um, Fred Kemp, Earl Turpington, so many great musicians. And when we moved into the Treme when I was about eight, it was the same type of situation. So many musicians would just always come by the house. We lived right around the corner from James Black. Uh, he was a huge inspiration to me musically, compositionally, and so forth. So. And by the time you moved to Treme, you were already reading music? Uh, I understand yeah. you started pretty young. Your dad taught you uh, at first? Well, I started playing trumpet when I was four. Um, I asked my father for a trumpet, and he bought me one for Christmas. Um, he bought me a pocket trumpet, which is like a more compact version. If you are familiar with Don Cherry, that's, he plays a pocket trumpet. Um, and uh, just playing tunes I heard on the radio, stuff like The Saints, what have you. Uh, how I learned to read music was that my father would uh, write out songs that he had already heard me playing or picking up by ear and he wrote the notes down with the fingering, so I began to identify what I was hearing with sight. And I pretty much learned to read like within a couple of days from, from him doing that. And this, of course, counters a lot of the mythology that is applied to New Orleans musicians as being intuitive players, blues-oriented players who don't have musical literacy. And in fact, uh, this is a long tradition of, of people uh, that have these skill levels uh, in New Orleans going all the way back to the early 20th century when we're talking about New Orleans music. Uh, whatever it takes to do the gig properly is usually the skill level that's sought out by the musicians here. Well, I've always been of the thinking that, you know, being educated and having a theoretical knowledge of music is not uh, mutually exclusive from being an intuitive, soulful person. Uh, even a lot of musicians I, I encountered over the years those who were more self-taught or, or played by ear were afraid to read music because there was this idea that somehow you might lose your soulfulness. And um, it's this kind of nonsense. I think the more things you have in your acumen uh, musically, the more versatile you are, are, and the better musician you can be overall. I think the more things you know, the more options you have and the greater you can be at whatever it is you choose to do. And these are all tools that allow you to explore the terrain of New Orleans music uh, in so many different ways. Now, you've already mentioned that you started with a pocket trumpet and play trumpet, but what other instruments do you play? Because I've heard you play several. Piano, bass, drums, trombone, tuba, clarinet. Um, <laughs> that's all I could think of right now. For now. <laughs> So uh, no one band band recordings in the future uh, at present, uh, like B Sidney Bechet in 1940. Well, actually, I did one already. Oh, you did? Oh, yeah. I missed something. Yeah, so. Well, what was that like? What was the inspiration? I mean, you, a song you wrote where you performed on all the instruments? Uh, well, it, it's something I had in the back of my mind for a while, and it's something that uh, guys would always say I should do, you know. Um, but I never wanted it to be like a novelty thing where, oh, look at me, I'm playing all these instruments. Um, so when I was recording my record, Into the Blue, um, I had just brought a, bought a Pro Tools uh, home, which is a, like a recording studio, uh, or a digital workstation. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was the first time I went into the studio with uh, a demo to let cats hear the music beforehand because I didn't want them to just read the music. I wanted to imbue the feeling of what I was going for on this record. So I played all the instruments uh, at my studio at home. And uh, my bass player, uh, Vicente, remarked, he was like, man, you don't need us. You could have just <laughs> did the record yourself. And uh, I said, you know what, next time that, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> what high school did you go to before you were in NOCA? I uh, went to uh, Eleanor McMain from 7th to 11th, and my last year I went to uh, Warren Easton. And when NOCA opened up, I mean, we know the track record of NOCA, and we know what, how valuable uh, this institution has been 
uh, to the development of New Orleans music. Um, what was it like, in other words, uh, you know, how'd you get in there? Uh, what was your experience uh, as part of that? Uh, you already mentioned uh, Clyde Kerr Jr., but who were you working with when you were in Milka? I was working with Clyde, uh, also uh, Dr. Bert Bro, who was a fabulous theory teacher, classical musician, and the vocal teacher, uh, Lorraine Alfaro, who later became my vocal teacher again when I started seriously trying to sing a couple years ago. Um, marvelous, I mean, world class. We had a faculty that was as great as any university um, in the world at the high school level. So uh, the information that we were exposed to at that age prepared us for so much for years and years to come. And I, I remember Dr. Bro always used to joke uh, when we do a test, he was like, this is third year college or whatever, and we always used to say whatever. And when we got to college, we, we like knew more than the juniors and seniors there. Mm -hmm. So um, that was a really great preparatory uh, for being professional. Such a great program and that new location, that floating drum room that they've got there, that just knocks me out. You know, these are the facilities that we need to keep the tradition moving forward. You were a very young man when you were operating on a professional level and uh, one of the things that, that I really remember is, is when you bonded with Doc Cheatham and uh, the recording you did with him, the, the performance you did. Uh, why don't you give us some backstory on how you got to know Doc, uh, Too Sweetly Yours, Doc Cheatham, such sure. a wonderful spirit, but you guys worked so well together and, and there was a message that was into that relationship, I think, for everyone to see, because sometimes, you know, in this country, generations are all separated. You know, if you're not young, you don't count, or if you're old, you're a has-been and whatnot, but, but that was not a problem for you guys. You just like, totally connected and made some beautiful music together, so tell us a little bit about that. Um, well, before I talk about Doc, I'd like to talk about uh, another gentleman who helped me out, who actually facilitated me meeting Doc who was uh, Clark Terry. Um, I first met Clark when I was playing in the All-Star Brass Band. It was like the first serious gig I had. Um, James Andrews, uh, who's trombone shorty's older brother, uh, had heard that I was playing and he asked my father could I join their band, so I started playing with them in the Treme. And um, we got invited to do this uh, cruise uh, on the SS Norway for like a week. There were all these musicians there, Dizzy Gillespie, Clark Terry, all these people. Um, so when James got wind that there were going to be all these greats on it, uh, to, he, he was a trumpet player as well. He still is a trumpet player. Uh, he was like, well, you can make this gig, but if you're going to make this gig, you have to play the trombone. I don't want you playing the trumpet. <laughs> right? So I was kind of heated about it, but I, I really wanted to play. So I had never played the trombone before, so I went and bought one from the pawn shop for like $15 and got my trombone chops together and, and made the gig. So we're playing uh, on the boat and uh, in walks Clark Terry and already he's like one of my idols at that time. I was listening to a record of his called uh, Clark After Dark and it had totally changed my world. And um, with him in his band was Al Gray, the fabulous trombonist used to play with the uh, Count Basie Orchestra. So here comes Clark and Al Gray and they're sitting there. I'm like, oh wow, you know. So we're playing and we finish the set. So I make a beeline right over to Clark. I'm like, oh, Mr. Terry, you know, I, I really love your playing. You know, you're a big idol of mine. He kind of like shuns me off like, yeah, whatever. Um, <laughs> and uh, now I was kind of hurt, you know. So then Al Gray sees me, the trombonist. He's like, man, you know, you, you're really talented, but you know, he picked up my trombone and the slide was rusty. He was like, <laughs> Man, you, you got to take better care of your instrument. Come to my room. I'll give you some lessons, you know. And I'm like, man, I don't want trombone lessons, you know. <laughs> I don't even want to play this thing. So the funny thing is that that whole cruise, I was trying to talk to Clark Terry, and he was ignoring me. And Al Gray kept chasing me to try to come and get lessons. So um, a couple, as fate would have it, a couple of months later, Clark Terry came down to New Orleans. And he and James Andrews were friends. So we used to have this place in the Treme we used to rehearse called The Shop. And I um, was like, yeah, Clark, Clark Terry is coming to the shop. We're going to have a jam session tonight. So uh, I had my trumpet this time when we were playing. And like, I started playing, and Clark's mouth just dropped. Wow. And he was like, wow. You know, so he came up to me. He was like, man, you know, 
I didn't know you could play like that. You know, you, you're so talented. He was like, all this time, I just thought you were some sad trombone player who, <laughs> whose arms were too short to reach the seventh position. <laughs> so um, from that moment on, he took me under his wing and like recommended me for gigs and was just like a, a second musical father to me. Um, so a couple of years later, he took me on the cruise with him. And um, I was looking on the schedule and I saw Doc Cheatham and I, at the time I wasn't really that familiar with him. I knew he played trumpet, so I went to go check him out and at the time he was like 80 years old. And I was just blown away by his, his playing and his posture and his whole demeanor and everything. So I was very shy, still am, but I, I went, I mustered a, enough courage to go talk to him. I said, hi, Mr. Cheatham, I'm from New Orleans, a trumpet player. And he lit up and he started telling me about Louis Armstrong and King Oliver and how when he went to Chicago in the 20s, those were the only guys who, who were nice to him, who were kind to him. And um, he invited me up the next set and that was the beginning of a, a relationship we would uh, carry on, with, that would carry on for the rest of his life. That was beautiful. And now we know how come Troy picked up trombone as well. <laughs> Well, you have a lot of uh, albums and CDs uh, to your credit, and a little later on, we're going to hear a cut from your most recent, which is uh, BAM at uh, Bohemian uh, Caverns, uh, live at Bohemian Caverns, and uh, we're going to sample some of that first cut, because the first cut's like 17 minutes long, uh, but we're going to see how that uh, piece of music evolves. But uh, following what you did with Doc, uh, you had lots of different projects. You've always been one to really sort of explore terrain and, and not necessarily chain yourself to any given style, but, but to sort of subsume styles and mix them up and, and create uh, new pathways uh, mm -hmm. for yourself. So uh, tell us a little bit about some of those projects and, and how they evolved. Uh, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I've always looked at music as an experience a tool of expression and ultimately, you know, I consider myself an artist and music is one of the ways that I choose to express that. Um, given that, uh, you know, it's like colors and there are all these beautiful colors out there, like why relegate yourself to just a few when there's so many different combinations and things you can get. So um, all the things that I love, I try to find out what it is and seek out the, the what fundamentally how it works and to try to figure out how to deconstruct it and put it together my own way. Um, and I'm constant, it's a constant process of uh, evolution and studying and having fun at the same time. Yeah. Case in point, Peyton's Place, 1998. And uh, you have some collaborations on there with people like Wynton Marcellus and Roy Hargrove. Um, Tell us about these relationships, because I know, for example, I heard you when you were at uh, Jazz and Lincoln Center, 1997, doing a Bechet Centennial uh, with Winton. That's when we were working on the Ken Burns Jazz Series for PBS. And, uh, you know, there's a generosity to your playing. I think when, when you're in group situations or you're interacting with people, it's a very interesting thing to see, along with the creativity uh, that you're talking about. But tell us a little bit about how you got to know Winton, how you got to know Roy, and some of the things that developed as a result of that? Uh, how did I meet Wynton? Uh, he, Wynton called, was in town and he called my father for something and uh, I actually picked up the phone. And uh, he was like, yeah, this is Wynton, can I speak to your Walter? So I gave my dad the phone and at that time I was really starting to check Wynton out and Terrence. And uh, so I got the bright idea to grab my trumpet and start practicing, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> he asked my dad, who is that playing the trumpet? He was like, oh, that's my son. So he's like, oh, bring him over to the house and I'll give him a lesson. So that's how I met him. Yeah, and you ended up in his band, too. Uh, and Roy is one of my favorites. R Roy has so many different projects, like R.H. Factor, the big band. Uh, I've heard him so many interesting situations, and I understand you guys were label mates together, but you did some collaboration. Right, right. Uh, I actually met Roy through Winton, um, and years later I would find out, like he, you know, he would tell me about, yeah, this young kid in Texas, Roy Hargrove, look out for him, and 
years later when I met Roy, uh, he told me that Wint was telling him the same thing about me. And uh, it's funny because when we first started, we kind of hit the scene around the same time and uh, Wint would have these things called battle royales over at the, when Lincoln Center just got started, the jazz part. And uh, he would always pit me and Roy together in a kind of competitive battle. But it was always out of love. And, and uh, I think we've inspired each other to, to each other's creative heights. It's always been a very inspirational rela relationship. And the sort of tutelage that you had with uh, various other veteran musicians, and particularly I'm thinking like uh, spend some time with Elvin Jones. Uh, that must have been amazing. I mean, Elvin, one of the all-time great drummers. I know you've worked with Adonis uh, for a long, long time. Now you last, uh, Lenny White, mm -hmm. another amazing drummer, was with you the other day mm -hmm. uh, out here. But what was it like working with Elvin? Where was he at, and where were you at, and how did that work together? Yeah, um, Winton actually recommended me for that gig. I got the call to do a week with him at the Blue Note Club in New York, like in January. I had just joined uh, the program at uh, UNO under the tutelage of um, Alice Marcellus and uh, Harold Baptiste. And uh, I did that week with him. Actually, after the first night, when, I mean, uh, Elvin asked me to join the band. And so it was either go to school or join one of the greatest drummers in the world. So I picked going with Elvin. And I played with him for like two years. Amazing. Uh, some of the other projects that uh, were happening at that time, is, you know, you're still living in New Orleans, but everyone knows that you really pursue a career, American music, you gotta spend a lot of time in New York, you gotta spend a lot of time on the road. Uh, what were those experiences like for you? When, because you know, New Orleans is its own world. And when you leave New Orleans and you start seeing what other places are like, uh, you bring back something a little different. So how did that work for you? Um, it's always been kind of interesting. I mean, New Orleans has always been my home, both spiritually and even physically. Uh, I never moved to New York. Um, I was uh, very fortunate to have a strong presence in New York without having to have actually moved there. And because of the road that was paved through like Terrence and Donald Harrison and Harry Connick and all those folks. There was already sort of a buzz around these New Orleans musicians. Uh, the flip side to that was sometimes there was also an animosity from the New Orleans, uh, from the New York cats because here are these New Orleans guys taking our gigs. Um, but uh, for the most part, it, I was always received very well, particularly by the older musicians. I always gravitated towards them. Even as a child, you know, I would much rather be inside listening to the old folks talk than outside, you know, with my peers and whatnot. So it's always been important to me to learn as much from and be around the masters as much as possible. And now that many of them are gone, I feel very fortunate that uh, uh, I had the foresight to be able to spend time with so many people who are not here. Um, and now I don't consider myself old, but being, uh, having played with Art Blakey and being, you know, Ray Brown and Ray Charles and so many people who are no longer here, I am, uh, have become a link for guys younger than me and even some my age to people who they, they never saw before or heard or play. So um, I, I feel a sense of responsibility to share that and impart some of the hard, tough lessons that they imparted to me. Um, it's particularly nowadays when we're in, a, in an era of social media, not that anything's wrong with it, but I find that it fosters um, antisocial behavior and just the general disrespect that I've seen growing amongst youngsters a good, uh, about things that are old. And I think it happens with every young generation, like you think you know everything mm -hmm. when you're younger, and the older you get, the, the wisdom that the masters give you, it resonates more and more with you, uh, with maturity, if you have sense. Um, <laughs> sometimes it doesn't ever resonate. <laughs> so um, that, that's kind of um, where I am with it and what it means to me. And 
I found myself in an interesting position because it, even though I'm very shy in one regard, I've become very vocal in another about the music and how important tradition is. I think it's important to be an individual and we're talking about creative expressive music, but it's of primary importance to respect the ancestry, to respect the story of the great black musicians who died to play this music. It's very important uh, to notice and to share that you know, it's just not something you do for fun, although it's a fun thing, but there's a serious story and a serious message behind this music that needs to be addressed and talked about in part of the conversation. There's a responsibility, and we are gonna talk some more about that in one second, but first I wanna ask you about what music you came up with. In other words, what you listen to, what you pull on. When we talk about the tradition, there's a canon in jazz history, and the canon is sort of policed by various scholars and other people, but then there's the actual experience a musician has, which doesn't always conform to the way the canon is constructed. And sometimes you're borrowing ideas and, and you're inspired by things that are you know, surprising. So, um, or in retrospect, might be considered surprising. So I want you to talk a little bit about just when you were coming up, what you like to listen to, what you like to draw upon, what inspired you musically. Um. I mean, in my youth, it was listening to whatever people in my age group was listening to. Um, I was very much into hip hop. I was a child in the era where hip hop was born. So that was very much a part of what I was doing in my listening experience. Uh, was brought up on Earth, Wind and & Fire, and Stevie Wonder, Donny Hathaway, Roberta Flack. Um, even classical music, my father would, you know, in between gigs or even after gigs late at night, practice Bach cello suites for two hours. You know, after working, teaching school all day and doing two, three gigs sometimes at night and then come home and practice all night. So, you know, uh, there was never this um, discrimination in, in terms of music. It was always just good, beautiful music. And uh, even before I developed a taste for it myself, I was listening to music that was well beyond my years and that was instilled in me. Um, it was around 11 years old when I seriously uh, got into more mature forms of music, I'll say. Um, I picked up a record out of my father's collection called uh, Four and More by the great Miles Davis. And um, that record completely changed my world. And I note uh, on your new CD, You've written a lot of tunes, but you're also covering Monk and you're covering Miles Davis uh, mm -hmm. on that CD. Uh, what we'd like to do now is play a sample of the first cut uh, from Nicholas's new CD. Uh, it's called The Backward Step, and uh, it's 17 minutes long, so we're not gonna listen to all of it, but we want to hear a little bit of it because there's a lot of interesting things going on, and uh, Nick is not just playing trumpet, he's playing uh, Fender Rhodes piano as well, which, you know, some people actually they, they saw that as an anachronistic piece of equipment, and I think what you're showing here is that it really is a very useful tool uh, for creative expression. So uh, let's uh, hear a little bit, uh, maybe about four minutes of the, uh, the backward step, and then we're going to talk about it and about that uh, recording. But without further ado, I'd like to um, have you join me in welcoming to Bohemian Caverns, Nicholas Payton, featuring everyone. <laughs>
keeps rolling. That's some gorgeous music, really introspective, spiritual, so creative. There's so much going on there. Thank you. The backward step. Is there something specific uh, that title uh, refers to? Uh, the title um, comes out of a time where I was deeply into studying Zen Buddhism. And it's about self-reflection. Uh, actually, the, the chant is um, the, from the opening theme is Maka Hanya Haramita Shinyo, which is from the Heart of Wisdom Sutra. So um, it's all about you know going within to find the interconnectivity of all things. It's a beautiful piece of music and. Um the African tinge is another. We're not going to listen to it, but I urge you to familiarize yourself with this uh, record because there's some wonderful stuff in there. And in that particular cut, you've got the Fender Rose sounding like a distorted fuzz guitar, and it's a piece that like really rocks as well as has a lot of intrinsic funk to it. So there are many moods expressed on this uh, this most recent project. That yeah that. African Tinge piece was actually inspired by a quote I read of uh, Santana, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, but he says that a lot of this music that we think of and consider Latin music is actually African music. Um, and so Juddy Roll Morton had the Latin tinge, I figured I'd have the, the African tinge. I made my first trip to Africa last June, to Senegal, for a conference. And uh, some of the musicians that we heard there are here in the Senegal tent. Uh, Les Frères Dia, uh, Demadia, and his uh, four brothers, four of whom have never been on an airplane, never been out of uh, Saint Louis, uh, Senegal, uh, before. And uh, they're performing over there. I would urge you, uh, if you want to know what that African tinge is about, uh, you can experience it today. And uh, it's, it's amazing because that perspective, in other words, to be in Africa and then to look west and to see things from that perspective is, is an eye opener. It really is. I mean, it's something uh, that enlightened me uh, tremendously. And I would um, uh, suggest that anybody who loves New Orleans music could benefit uh, from that kind of experience. Uh, to switch gears a little bit, we're going to take uh, some questions in about five minutes or so. But uh, Nick has also done other things besides uh, write music and perform music. Uh, I'm thinking of Robert Altman's film, uh, Kansas City, for example. You've done some acting as well. Is that something that appeals to you and that you'd like to do more? Uh, sure, if it's a cool situation. Um, I actually had the honor recently to be in the very last episode of uh, Treme, actually playing this tune we just heard. Ah, so, wonderful, uh, wonderful. I'm glad you picked that one. Uh, well, in fact, let me ask you, because everyone gets asked this question, uh, so since I got you here, what do you think of Treme? What, you know, your experience, but also as an observer in terms of how Treme has put New Orleans on display? Um, honestly, I, I kind of have mixed feelings about it. Um, uh, I think initially I was so happy to see a lot of the people I know, and particularly, the musicians, you know, be showcased. Um, I think my, though it, it, it's probably the closest depiction of New Orleans I've seen on a series, um, I think at times it's suffered from being a bit sensationalized, you know. Yeah, and, and Simon's work, for example, uh, The Wire, uh, created a lot of public relations problems for Baltimore because it was so real. And to some extent, I felt that he maybe went light on New Orleans, that he didn't necessarily get as deep in some of those other areas and just sort of showcase the culture uh, because he wanted to help. But on the other hand, that creates some, uh, some eulachrom situations where people uh, depicted in New Orleans are doing things people in New Orleans would never do. So you know, I, I agree with you on that. Uh, another very good friend of mine who uh, uh, recently wrote a book about race and jazz, uh, Randy Sankey. You did a project on uh, uh, Louis Armstrong and Bix Beiderbecke uh, with Randy, 
And you know, musicians, uh, as you know in relation to Nick, have strong feelings and need to have strong feelings about the tradition and uh, how we should view uh, what this music is and, and how we should define it. I, I'm avoiding the term branding because the term branding is so commercial, but uh, it's important for musicians to be outspoken, particularly musicians in New Orleans, about what they do and to, to give a sincere uh, point of view so that we can understand uh, their own perspective on what they're doing and not just what scholars and academics write it up because New Orleans music has never really been branded or defined by New Orleans musicians. It's always been scholars in New York and Paris and elsewhere that have done the defining. So I think it's a very uh, fresh voice to hear uh, when Nick expresses himself on these issues. Is that my cue to express myself? Yeah. Uh, it is. Can I give the Cliff Notes version? Um, well, I, I guess I'll start with saying that you know, over the last several years, I've developed a disdain for the word jazz. Um, and upon my research and talking to a lot of musicians, I found that I was not alone in my feeling about this word. You know, it's being a very loaded term. It's come to represent something far different than I believe this, the spirit of this music actually is. And it's become sort of a term to lump a bunch of things together that actually has nothing to do with the true spirit of the music. And you know, if we look historically at the first bands who used this word, it was never necessarily the black musicians who actually created it. I mean, the first documented band was the original Dixieland jazz band. I mean, we could just look at that name and there's all kinds of uh, negative connotations in that. It certainly wasn't original, because there were some black guys doing it already. Um, Dixieland, well, that's slavery south. That's not too flattering. And uh, the music was a caricature of the great music uh, that was created by guys like King Oliver and, and Buddy Bolden and, and so forth. It was a minstrel version of the serious black American music at the time. Uh, and then we look at films like uh, The Jazz Singer, which Al Jolson does that classic rendition of Mammy. So is it jazz hands, the, you know, the, the, the whole, that whole aesthetic to me, which to me is, is, has changed, but it's still pretty pervasive. It's become more subtle, so I think um, it's a bit hard to, and we've been conditioned over a century of, of using that word, and a lot of people like saying it. Uh, and I don't think there's anything wrong with it per se, but it's the attitudes that have become pervasive with the uh, insignia that I find to be problematic. And, 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 and also with uh, Randy Sankey, I had a lot of issues with some of the things that he said in his book, because I think oftentimes as, as black Americans, we're often defined and categorized through a Western European lens, and that's not the aesthetic that this music comes out of. Yes, it can be broken down in theoretical Western terms, but the spirit of this music is, is something very different. And when I say black American music, I'm not saying that anybody can't play it. It's just acknowledging the roots of it, like you say Brazilian music or Cuban music or Mexican music or whatever else. No one has a problem with mariachi music. We know that comes from Mexico. But the moment you say black American music, people get offended and uncomfortable. And I think that's because we have a long way to go in terms of race relations in this, um, in this world. You know? And it's a convers conversation that needs to be had, honestly and upfront. Absolutely right, and when I was in Africa, <laughs> please, a round of applause. One of the things that we were striving for is, you know, we were talking about, I was in Senegambia, and we are talking about French colonialism, and uh, it, it's often portrayed as, well, civilization coming into uncivilized terrain. That's not it at all. What you have are two diametrically opposed versions of civilization in conflict. And so when we look at, and through an Afrocentric lens, uh, there's no other way to understand American music. And, and fortunately, there are uh, serials like Black Music Research Journal and others that have been emphasizing this uh, for a long time. And as, as Nicholas said, that doesn't mean it's defined by race. It's defined by the history. But uh, it's available, it's accessible to everybody, and anyone who loves it finds a way to participate. And, and so it's always inclusive 
uh, it's not exclusive, which Definitely. is part of the other uh, perspective that, that gets us into trouble so often in this country. Uh, we've got about four minutes left, so we can take uh, a few questions. Uh, uh, we have a microphone, Chris, so if, if you could, because this is being taped, if you could make your way up to the microphone, or perhaps someone could bring the microphone to you. The mic is coming to you. This is uh, Chris Strachwitz. Ah, Hi. here we go. Hi, I'm just Boom curious on. how you enjoyed working with the late Doc Cheatham when I thought you sounded just like King Oliver, and I thought this kind of second, you were, he was playing almost Louis's role, wasn't he? I was wondering how you enjoyed that kind of thing, because I thought you were just tremendous. Yeah, I, I love playing with Doc. Um, you know, a lot of people tended to focus on the, the, the idea that there were some 60 years in between us, but it never felt like that when we were playing music or even hanging out. Um, it was just two souls connecting w with something they loved, and we both shared a deep affinity for uh, New Orleans music and its musicians. Uh, it's funny you mentioned uh, me sounding like Joe King Oliver, because Doc always said I looked just like Joe King Oliver. <laughs> I think I'm a little cuter, but <laughs> you know. We could probably take one more question. Yes, sir, in the back, but head over to the mic if you would. And tell us who you are before you ask your question. Hey, Bruce, uh, David Hansen. Hey, David. How are you? New Orleans drummer. Ni Nicholas, you, you're an amazing musician. Absolutely genius. Um, love everything you do. Um, I, I grew up actually in Canada and um, was exposed to a lot of different styles of music as a child. My, my parents played Benny Goodman, Duke Ellington, Count Basie, whole array of, of different music. And I never knew who any of them were as a, as a child, like four years old. My mother would set me down in front of the, the stereo system and the music would just play. And it, it was about a couple of years ago we went back up to Canada and I was looking through my parents' record collection. And I pulled it out and I'm looking at it and thinking, this is amazing. I, I could smell the, 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 the smell that comes from the, um, the, the cardboard cover on the album itself. Um, and it just immediately brought back memories from when I was a child. And, and I, I remembered listening to these, even though they'd been out of my conscious mind for years and years and years. But the, the key point, I, I, I have a degree in music. I studied music. I'm a professional drummer here in town. And w one of my pet peeves is I, I, I hate the racism issue. It, it's about the music. I, di I didn't look at black or white when I was listening to those albums as a child. And, and I listened to it from a musical perspective. And um, it, it's, I love music, and I think most people should love music. And, and I've, again, growing up in Canada, I wasn't exposed to the, to the racial issues that you were most certainly exposed to here. Um, and I have a whole totally different perspective on, on, on views of, of racism in life uh, than, than a lot of people. Um, do you have a question? I, I do. You do need the question. Um, <laughs> I, I play with and represent, play drums with the original Dixieland Jazz Band. And it's an outstanding ensemble. Um, the music, to diminish that first band and say, oh, they were a bunch of white guys and they... Uh, they Did I say that? <laughs> it, it's in print. You did not say that. I'm sorry. But you, you did mention that they copied, that, that they weren't original. But a lot of their music was original. And they were very innovative. And again, it doesn't matter whether they were white or black or what, what attitudes. I'm listening to the music, and I like it. OK. Um, You're entitled to like it. OK. I, I have to cut you off, man, because Certainly. we're right at quarter after. OK. And, and since you didn't actually ask a question, Nick won't have to respond to it. Well, but we thank you for your point of view on this. Wh why are you dividing it up? I'm divided. So I created well, what, B what B A M, Black American music. It's, what's, it's, what's divisive about it, that? It's American music. It's cultural. It is. I said Black American, but Certainly. the black part puts you off. 
it doesn't put me off. As David. black people, uh, no, 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 no. David, no, we, no, we no, do no, have, no. no, but we're out no, of time. No, 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 but uh, this, we don't. <laughs> Why not you know, combine no, it no, together and, no, and, no, look, but, but and I'm, I'm not, em embrace what, but and listen, love the music? Can I answer your question? Mm -hmm. Okay. As a black person, we are constantly forced to deal in a construct that we didn't create, in which mm -hmm. we are in the minority. Certainly. So, you know, as a white person, it's easy to have the perspective to not see that or to, want to, to not deal with that. But as a black person, we have to deal with that all the time. So me saying black American music is not about saying, drawing a line in the sand and saying who can or can't play it. It's about saying that giving the credit to the black American people who created this music and gave it to everyone, the whole reason why we're here is because people who had no rights who probably couldn't come here a right. hundred years ago were not allowed to be here. Let, let me finish though. Um, it's a part of a cultural heritage of a, a group of people who created something despite the fact that they were not even recognized as human beings at that time. It's a terrible and, time. And, 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 it's, and, and it's something that has not completely dissipated. Absolutely. We, we can see even now with we have a black president which has brought up this new era of consciousness called, or lack of consciousness called post-race that somehow because we have a black president that we're beyond racism, but to me it's more visible than ever as a result of him not being able to get simple policy pushed through. So if he's a black man and a president and he can't do stuff, what does that say for the normal black person on the street? Right. So, 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 so one more thing, one more thing. So Bruce was talking about whatever, it, it's, it's about setting the story straight because it's like saying Christopher Columbus discovered America when there were already people here. It's sort of like, you know, uh, conservatives telling Mexicans go back to your country when half of America was Mexico before they were sectioned off and quarantined I, to a I, certain part. So, yeah. and, and like we say that you know that, that somehow you know we were civilized because as Africans we all had bones in our noses and just played drums and primal. When when Egypt Egyptian civilization is the first recorded civilization. So before. European civilization and before Greek civilization, all that stuff existed in Egypt. And contrary to popular belief, Egypt is not the mi Middle East, it is Africa. That's yeah. all I have to say. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Nicholas. All right, and thanks, David. And thanks to everyone.